Hello and welcome to episode number 16 of CS350 Online. I'm your host Leslie and in today's episode we're going to talk about the wonderful topic of scheduling. But first, the OS of the day. Now, today's operating system has a lovely tie into our school and to a course that I know so many people actually like or feel like they like or want to take. So this operating system is called QNX and many of you may have actually heard of QNX before. That wouldn't surprise me. QNX was uh, created in 1982 and it was a product of, of quantum software systems, uh, which was of course acquired by RIM, which is now apparently known as BlackBerry, whatever you want to call that company today. BlackBerry will always be RIM to me because when I was an undergrad, it was RIM. It's just the way it was. Anyways. QNX was created by two students in computer science, Gordon Bell and Dan Dodge, who had taken trains. And while they were taking trains, they thought to themselves, I think the world needs a real-time operating system, like a proper one. And so they actually, you know, had time whilst taking trains to actually start the development of their own real-world, real-time operating system. And hence, QNX was supposedly born. So, what is QNX? Now, I know many of you may have actually, you know, used it before, including myself. Um, it is a Unix-like operating system. It is real-time, which means that, you know, we talk about operating systems as real-time, and then we also talk about a specific branch of operating systems called the real-time operating systems. And the, kind of the difference between, you know, a regular operating system like Windows or Mac OS or GNU Linux is, and, and a real-time operating system like QNX is the guarantees that the OS makes on response times. So something like QNX is going to be exceptionally responsive to events happening. And you want it to be because QNX is going to be an operating system used in things like cars, self-driving ones. And if a little old lady is crossing the street and your self-driving car is, you know, barreling down the road at 80 kilometers an hour, you kind of want the car to stop. So you want a real-time OS for that. So this is going to mean things like not just guarantees about how long it takes to respond to something, but also shorter scheduling quantums and so on and so forth. And a smaller footprint generally. Now, in addition to it being a real-time operating system, QNX is also a microkernel operating system with its kernel originally being only 44 kilobytes, which is amazingly small. And it, the kernel actually only contains interrupt redirection. Note we didn't say interrupt handlers, we said interrupt redirection. Uh, timers, the CPU scheduler, and IPC. So everything else from virtual memory to what have you, file systems, was all implemented as a user process. So the very bare minimum was actually in the kernel of this OS. And what's really great about that is when you have an OS that's so small, you can actually put it on a piece of hardware. And if you have an OS on a piece of hardware, that's going to be way faster than actually having some, uh, an operating system operate off of like a disk. So that's kind of cool. Now, this operating system is actually used in a lot of different places. And originally, it was used by the Ontario School Board. And um, I mean, this comes down to this thing where the Canada likes to have a certain percentage of the things that are used to actually be homegrown. Uh, but where you actually see QNX being used is in industrial applications. Um, so think about like robots. So if you've got a car plant that's got uh, robots building cars, then you might use QNX as your operating system because it's real time and it's very small and it's very fast. Um, so as of the point in time where I actually made this slide, which is a couple years ago, there were over 56 million cars in this world that were actually running QNX. Uh, you'll see it in the navigation system. So you know how a lot of cars these days actually have like that and I really hate this word, infotainment system, where it like shows you a map. It lets you answer phone calls and you can watch TV on it or maybe listen to music. Side story, I installed one such device in my car. My car did not come with this device, but I actually uh, had one installed because you know, if you've got two kids and you're frequently making three or four hour drives, it would be good to have some form of entertainment in the car. I do actually think, by the way, mine runs QNX. <laughs> so you've got that and that's not just in cars you'll see that you'll see that in like aircraft so airplanes you'll see a lot of 
uh, QNX installed carrier grade routers. So that's things like the routers that Rogers has, not the router that's sitting in your basement. Sad story, my network in my house is actually to the point where I may have to purchase a router of said nature. <laughs> Don't ask. All my light bulbs are connected to the internet. Anyways. <laughs> um, and of course, if you are following RIM, then you know they have this device or had this device called the Playbook. RIM's still alive, by the way. Blackberry, whatever they call themselves. Um, but the Playbook ran QNX, and I believe their phones still run a variation of QNX. Ford uses it. It's, it's everywhere. And what's funny is, you know, when most people come to university or college, they're like, oh yeah, it's a time for experimenting and for trying things. And while some people are out there trying drugs and all these other things, I tried operating systems. So there was like this period of time where I actually used QNX. No reason. It looked cool. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So where did we leave off last day? Well, last day we actually finished our uh, discussion of virtual memory so we can put that in our pockets remember it and i will by the way try to get the quizzes up for that running as soon as possible what always ends up happening is um, i go to get the quiz running and i'll i'll be like upstairs putting my son to bed and that two-factor authentication comes up every single time and um, i won't have my cell phone with me so I can't log in to learn. And then by the time my son is asleep, I come downstairs and I completely forget about it. Or I can't find the cell phone. I will get that quiz up. I really hate that duo two-factor authentication. It's really irritating. All right, so we are going to start a new topic now. And we may be able to get through this whole topic today. Maybe we don't. It's, it doesn't really matter. But our... Um, our topic that we are starting is the topic of scheduling. So, without further ado, of course, these slides, as always, are posted to the course website. When we're talking about scheduling, this is something we've completely avoided talking about for the previous two months of this term. We've just kind of said, you have no control over what order the threads execute in. And that is very true. You don't have any control over the order that threads will be chosen to run in because there are a lot of things at play in making that decision. But let's say you have a context switch. How does the operating system actually choose which thread gets to go next? Because there's lots of different ways that you can do it. Um, OS161, for example, likes to do something called round robin scheduling. So what's going to happen with round robin scheduling, as we'll see in a few minutes, is it's essentially FIFO with pre preemption. So whenever you get um, preempted, you go to the back of the line. And then we always choose from the front of the line. And this is a really simple scheduling algorithm. And it has lots of really great features. But we haven't taken into consideration what happens on a yield. We haven't taken in, into consideration what happens when threads block. We haven't taken into consideration that some threads may have higher priorities than the others. So now we want to take some time and actually look at some of the different scheduling algorithms that exist out there. And we're going to start by taking you back in time to the 1950s and looking at some of the earliest ideas for scheduling that we had and referring to things as jobs. So let's suppose then that we have this set of jobs. And for each of the jobs that are out there, we know what time the job arrived. And we also know how long each job is going to take to run. And then if we were trying to create a scheduling algorithm, we might want to try to minimize things like response time and turnaround time. Now, what those two comp computations are is the response time is how long does it take between when the job actually arrives and when the job starts running. And then the turnaround time is the time between the job arriving and the job actually completing. And if we were scheduling or creating a scheduling algorithm, we'd want to minimize that because we want jobs to not have to wait very long and we want them to actually finish in a very timely fashion. So how can we devise some kind of scheduling algorithm to do this? Now there's more than just these two things here we want to minimize. Something else we want to do for scheduling is we want to make sure that jobs don't start. I want to make sure that every job that arrives actually get its chance to run. 
Because if there's some job that doesn't get a chance to run, then there's some user out there that's waiting forever for that job that's never going to run. So we wanna prevent starvations. So we're going to use these Gantt charts to kind of describe the scheduling algorithms. So let's talk about our first one, which is first come first served. Absolute world's easiest scheduling algorithm there is. So all you're doing here is the jobs are going to run in the order that they arrived. So in our case, we have four jobs. Three of them were there at time zero. We're going to assume that job one arrived just, you know, a nanosecond before two and a nanosecond before three. So what's going to happen is we're going to run the earliest job, which is job one. Job one is going to run to its completion, which is at unit time unit five. Now these units at the bottom, it doesn't matter what the units are. It's just time. We're just marking the passage of time. And then when job one is complete, then we'll we'll choose the next job to run. And the next job is job two because it's the next one in line. And then eight units later, we're going to get job three. Now job four arrived at time five, but when a new job arrives, it's always going to go to the back of the line. So this actually makes perfect sense, right? Now, this is going to guarantee that every job gets a fair chance to run because there's not going to be any starvation. No job is going to get infinitely pushed back. When the jobs ahead of you have completed, you will run. End of story. However, if you are a user on this system, because we are running jobs serially effectively, and we're not giving, you know, we're not doing any context switches, any user who is waiting to open VLC while you're surfing, you know, Tinder or something in Chrome, I don't even know if that opens in Chrome, I don't know. <laughs> they're going to have to wait for you to finish before their VLC will open. So this doesn't actually create a very interactive environment. So while this scheduling algorithm is very, very simple, it's not good for a multi-user system or for creating that illusion of concurrency. So we can add preemption to fix it. So that's kind of neat. So what we're going to do is we call round robin is actually a preemptive first come first serve. And so now we have to introduce the concept of the scheduling quantum. And in all of our slides, our scheduling quantum is two units. So what's going to happen with this one is when your quantum expires, you are preempted. If you get preempted, you go to the back of the line. That's it. You go to the back of the line. So allow me to show you to actually draw this out so you can see what it does. So I am going to, I'm going to bring this up. What I am going to do is actually trace through this. So you can see exactly how we are making each choice at each time unit. So there are our jobs here at the bottom and their arrival and their runtime. Okay. Let's get a new page and let's put some lines down so that apparently I still have a clock on this one. <sighs> I love buggy software, don't you? All right, so here we go. So we've got T zero, time zero. And at time zero, these are the jobs we have. And this is going to be my ready queue, we're going to call it. So I've got J1. And then for each job, I'm going to indicate how many units of time it has left to run. So J1 has five. Nobody has been selected for running yet. T2 has eight. And J3 has three. So I'm going to choose a thread or one of these jobs to run. I'm going to choose the one at the front of the line. So job one gets to run. Now job one is going to, because it's runtime is longer than the scheduling quantum at time two, job one ends up getting preempted. So at time two, our queue looks like this. And job one is now at the back of the line. And as you can see, it's left runtime is, has been updated. And now I'm going to select, of course, job two because it's at the front. And then at time four, it gets preempted. And it goes to the back of the line. 
Now at time five, something interesting happens. Uh, there's no preemption, so I'm going to draw this in a different color. But at time five, we have a new job arrive. Let's draw this properly here. So first off, the job three. So at time five, my queue looks like this. You'll know the job three is missing, and the reason why job three is missing is because it's what's running. But keep in mind that a, th a job arriving is not going to preempt somebody else. At time six, job three gets preempted, and so my queue is going to look like this. And I'm going to end up choosing, of course, job one again. And then this is going to continue. There we go. Scroll down. And at time eight, we're going to choose job two again. So that gets preempted at time 10. And now we choose job four finally. And job four doesn't get preempted at time 12. It actually completes at time 12. So at time 12, what you see is that we have one fewer job in our queue. And then job three only has one unit of time left. So at time 13, it doesn't get preempted. It simply terminates. And the same thing happens at time 14 when job one finishes. And then at time 14, we're left with just job two. And so job two is going to run. And then of course, at time 16, it will get selected again because there's no other jobs in the system. And then at time 18, of course, everything will be done. So there you go. That is running through the round robin scheduling for this particular example. And this is actually what OS 161 does. The variant of it. So that's not too bad, right? Okay. Now, this was very, very fair. Very fair. Uh, everybody got a chance to run. By having a scheduling quantum and preemption, we are now giving each thread an opportunity to actually run. So we are giving the users that illusion of threads running in parallel, even though they technically aren't. But this, this is a desirable thing. However, this does not take into consideration what do you do when thread yields. It doesn't take into consideration threads that have blocked and have become unblocked. It doesn't, also doesn't take into consideration uh, priorities. So just keep that in the back of your mind. The one thing it does guarantee, though, is there's no starvation. Every thread is going to be able to make progress always. So the thing we didn't do was minimize turnaround time, and we certainly didn't minimize uh, response time. So are there any methods that would minimize that? And the answer is yes, there are. So on average, this method called shortest job first will minimize the average turnaround time. So, what is shortest job first? Instead of having a queue, we're going to have a pool. And we are always going to choose the job that has the shortest runtime to go. So, looking at my pool at time zero, I have job one, job two, and job three. And of job one, job two, and job three, job three has the shortest runtime. So, job three goes first. When job three finishes, I'm going to take a look at my other jobs. I've got job two and job one. Well, job one is shorter, so job one goes next. And then at time eight, I have to choose between job two and job four. Well, job four is going to go because it's shorter than job eight, even though job four is newer. So job four goes, and then finally job two. But the big problem with this particular method is that threads can starve. Your jobs will starve. Let me explain this in another way. There is this thing you're supposed to do in a grocery store uh, to be courteous to the other people. If you have two carts of ramen noodles and toilet paper and um, somebody comes up behind you and they have a single banana, courtesy dictates you let them go in front of you. 
Well, here's the thing. In an operating system, or in this world, most jobs are actually very short. And so you, with your two carts full of ramen noodles and toilet paper, keep letting the people with single items go in front of you. Oh, look, you have a bag of milk. You go in front of me. Oh, look, you have a bag of chips. Go in front of me. But here's the problem. You are going to starve to death in the grocery store because you keep letting other people in front of you and you never end up getting to check out. And that's what's going to happen with shortest job first. Because there are many more small jobs arriving all the time, a very old long job may never get selected to run. So that's always a fun uh, side effect of shortest job first. Now, can we do any better by adding some preemptions? So this one is called shortest remaining time first. What shortest remaining time first, and I've seen a few different implementations of this actually, uh, is we are going to now allow preemption, but how the preemption works is instead of saying the shortest job first, we're saying who has the least amount of time left. So shortest remaining time. And when a new job arrives, we are going to stop and reselect a new job to run. So let's walk through this like we did with the other one. All right, so same jobs as before, same run times as before, but what we're gonna do now is we're going to have, instead of a ready queue, we're gonna call it the ready pool. And let's start at T0. At T0, I have job one, which has five units, job two, which has eight units, and job three, which has three units left. So obviously the shortest remaining time is job three, so it goes. And it's going to run to completion because no jobs arrive while it's running. So at time three, I have to choose between job two and job one. And job two has a remaining time of five, so we're of course going to choose job one. Now at time five, we get preempted because a new job has arrived. And so my ready pool is going to look like this. And so what's gonna happen here is when we get preempted, we reevaluate the remaining times and note that the new job has a shorter remaining time. And so the new job ends up getting selected. And it's going to complete at time seven so at time seven, we have job one and job two here. And then what's going to happen, of course, is we're gonna choose job one because it has the shortest remaining time. And then at time 10, all we have left is job two. And so it's going to go, finally. So that's not so bad, except for the fact that this assumed there was a finite number of jobs and the job two, even though it had to wait a little bit more, it did end up running. But that's the thing is that's assuming the system is finite and that there are no new jobs arriving, except that's not true. And there are always new jobs arriving, which means job two could continuously get pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. So the, one of the biggest problems with the shortest remaining time or shortest job first is the fact that starvation is completely and totally possible. But I gotta tell you something, there's another big problem here. And as someone just pointed out on Twitch, how does each job actually know how long it's going to run for? Hmm. Well, let me ask you this. If you sit down to play Breath of the Wild, and even if you say to yourself, I'm only going to play it for half an hour, do you end up playing it for half an hour? We, as users, don't know how long we're going to play games for. I can tell you, I, I let my, my six-year-old daughter, she likes to play Breath of the Wild. Um, and she's just gotten to Hateno Village. And um, she's on her way to, to release the, um, the, the tower there, the Shika Tower. And... Uh, so last night, 
don't know how many times did I say, okay, it's time to go to bed. It's time to go to bed. She didn't go to bed till after midnight because I said, no, no, I just got to go cook something. No, no, I've just got to go catch this horse. No, I just want to ride on this deer. It's, this is the problem. A user doesn't know how long that they are actually going to run for. I don't know how long I'm going to watch YouTube for. I don't know how long I'm going to play Red Alert 2 for. I might say, oh, let's play a quick game. And 18 hours later, we're still playing. <laughs> so if a user doesn't know how long they're going to run a job for, how could the computer know? The other, and, and it's more than that. Now you might be thinking, oh, well, we could do some machine learning and we should get some estimates. On average, people play this game for this long, so we could use those averages. But scheduling is supposed to be fast and if we're going to start involving things like uh, machine learning which i'm not saying that that hasn't been involved in scheduling before but you want this decision to be very very efficient because context switches should be happening very frequently so we want the scheduling algorithm to be faster maybe we don't want to be doing you collecting user statistics and building some big model to do it but there's a bigger problem too not only do we not know how long we're going to run things for Every single computer, every single time you run the program, may run for a different amount of time. Let me demonstrate this to you. So I'm going to open up my terminal here. I know this particular piece of code means nothing to you. It's a piece of research code, and what it does is it um, takes some lines and makes a second image to make a stereo line drawing. And... Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run it. And uh, well, let's clear the screen here. Yes, I know it has like 3,000 parameters. Probably have chosen the wrong one. I'm going to choose this one over here because this one doesn't actually have any output. This one here is going to take a list of points and it's actually going to draw them. So I'm going to use this uh, Unix command called time and I'm going to run this program and spline draw it creates a um, just a PNG image file uh, of some curves. So there we go. I ran it and it's a very fast program as you can see. But down here is the output from the time command and you can see that it took for my perspective. Um, you can see how much time it, it actually spent. So the real time is actually how much time elapsed from my perspective. And the user time is the cumulative how much time was spent actually performing this job. And then the system is how much time was spent executing kernel code while this user program was running. Yes, I realize that the user is significantly bigger than the real time. Again, this is because it's adding up how much time this spent on each CPU together. So it's how much time in total. But what's interesting here, ignoring that, what's interesting is I can run this program again, and you'll see that each and every single time I run it, I get totally different values. And then you have to agree that in between each of these times I've run it, I haven't changed anything else on my computer. So you would expect that each time I ran the program that it would give me the same result, but it's not. So there's a few things at play. If I ran this, first off, the hardware is going to dictate how long a particular job takes to run. Um, for example, I'm running this on my 2018 MacBook Pro. It has a core i9. It has, um, so there's six cores, so I can run 12 threads. It has 32 gigs of RAM. So it's gonna run pretty fast. If I go and run the same program on my other Mac, which is from 2013, I think, uh, it's going to take a different amount of time. And it's going to take a different amount of time because it only has a four core CPU and it only has 16 gigs of RAM. So the amount of processing power my other machine has is less than this one. So it's going to run faster on this computer here than the one that's sitting over there. And then if I take this same piece of code and I run it on my research server, which is finally back up, when it has 32 cores, it's going to take an even different amount of time. So how could you know how long a job is going to run for if, number one, you don't know how long you're going to run it for, and number two, how long it takes is different on every single 
hardware configuration. But there's another thing coming into play here. So I ran all of these experiments on the exact same computer and I didn't change anything in between each run. And yet I was still getting different times. Why? Well, because there's lots of things that are happening that you're not aware of. In particular here, I can see that I spent a bit more time actually executing kernel code. So there may be more context switches. Maybe there were some interrupts happening that you were not aware of. For example, maybe I received some network packets or maybe my Bluetooth devices were fighting with each other. There's a whole bunch of systems going on in your kernel that can that you are not aware of as a user that can impact how long a program is going to run for. So realistically, we don't know how long jobs are going to run for. Now, if you're one of those people who's writing like some kind of doing some research about performance, what you'll actually see is, and you see this in computer graphics papers a lot, um, they will list the spec of the computer that they ran it on. And then instead of running it once or twice, they will run it a hundred times and then compute the average. Um, and then, you know, give you know, a standard deviation. But even then, giving those results is kind of, still kind of meaningless. And this is actually why things like knowing the, um, you know, the big O notation, using the order notations to describe the behavior of a program is actually really important because the order notation isn't tied to the performance of the computing hardware or the operating system. So it describes things a little more clearly. And that is all I will talk about um, order notation and algorithm analysis in this course. Although I do find it funny that someone on Reddit thinks I'm teaching 341. <laughs> <laughs> I don't teach that course. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to our slides here. So one of the biggest problems with the algorithms that we've just lit, especially shortest time first and shortest remaining time, is that we don't know how jobs are going to run for. We didn't need that for first come first serve or round robin, but e none of these methods we've talked about uh, are taking into consideration blocked threads, priorities, yielding, or anything. Now you can modify round robin to handle blocked threads and yielding. Everything goes to the back of the line. Now how do you make round robin deal with priority? Well, we're going to have to change how we do things. So let's now stop looking at theoretical things and let's actually talk about some real scheduling algorithms. Like real world. And the one I want to talk about in particular is called multi-level feedback cues or MLFQ. And as the slide so boldly points out in bright red, this is the most commonly used scheduling algorithm. Now each operating system's version of this is going to be different, but we're going to introduce you to the main core concepts of what's going on here. So what, MLFQ is trying to do is it wants to make sure that any thread that is interactive, we're going to talk about threads, not jobs now. Threads that are interactive are going to be very responsive. Now, what is an interactive thread? Well, we are assuming that interactive threads are threads that block frequently because they're waiting for user input or they're waiting from pa for packets coming over the network, something like that, something that someone is interacting with and they're interacting with them. And that's going to cause, you know, a lot of blocks waiting for that interaction. So we want to make sure that we are very responsive to such threads because we want to make sure that when the button gets pushed, like the buttons on these, this little pen here, I want to make sure that whatever thread is waiting for buttons to be pushed, I want to make sure that it's receiving that data immediately. I mean, think about it this way. If you're playing any kind of first person shooter on your computer, you want to make sure that you're getting the absolute best frame rate possible for your game, because there's nothing worse than trying to play Unreal Tournament at anything less than 60 frames per second. Like I won't do it. I mean, I've played other games at less than 60 frames per second, like Warcraft three back in like the early two thousands. And I was getting like one frame every 30 seconds. <laughs> But you can't play a first person shooter like that. That just doesn't work. So we want to make sure that interactive threads like games are, are actually responding to user events very quickly. So what we want to do then is we want to make sure that we are giving a greater priority to those interactive threads. But the thing is, is the operating system doesn't actually know which threads are going to be interactive or not. 
So we don't really have a way of indicating, hey, this is an interactive thread. You need to run this with a greater priority. So we want to have some mechanism for kind of automatically determining which threads are interactive and which ones aren't. And that's kind of what MLFT was going to do. So the idea is that instead of having one ready queue, we're actually going to have N. And um, the highest priority queue is going to be QN, and the lowest priority queue will be Q1. And each of those queues behave as a round robin, well, not quite a round robin. They're going to be uh, FIFO, anyways, needless to say. And what's going to happen, and then another interesting thing is that the scheduling quantum for each of those queues is different. So our highest priority queue is actually going to have the shortest quantum. Now you might be sitting there thinking, why do you give the shortest scheduling quantum to the highest priority thing? Don't you want the highest priority thing to be able to run for longer periods of time uninterrupted? Well, that's not how we've defined priority. We've defined priority as threads that are interactive should have higher priority and threads that are interactive should block frequently. And if a thread that is uh, interactive blocks frequently, then that means that it should on average be blocking before the scheduling quantum expires. So our highest priority threads are going to have the shortest quantum and our lowest priority threads are going to have the longest scheduling quantums. And here's the basic idea. Every thread starts out because we know nothing about it in the highest priority queue. And our scheduler is always going to choose a thread to run from the highest priority queue that has threads in it. So if we try to choose a thread and there's one in QN, then we'll grab it. And if there's no threads in QN, then we'll go to QN minus one. And if there's no threads in QN minus one, then we go down to QN minus two and so on. So let's suppose we choose a thread from QN. Then what's going to happen is we will run the thread that came from the highest priority queue and our scheduling quantum is going to be very short. If the thread terminates or blocks before that quantum expires, well, if it terminates, we don't care, it's dead. <laughs> and choose again. If it blocks, then we're just going to choose another thread again. But when the thread unblocks, to make sure that we are responding to the unblocking of that thread as quickly as possible, that thread is going to preempt whatever thread was running, assuming it was of lower priority, and the thread that we just woke up is going to go into the highest priority queue. So when you wake up, you always go into the highest priority queue. Now, what happens if you yield and what happens if you get preempted? If you get preempted, you do not go onto the back of the queue that you came from. So if you were running at the highest priority and you got preempted, then you must not be that interactive. So we're not going to put you on the back of the highest priority queue. We're going to put you onto the back of the QN minus one. So we're going to put you down a level. And if you yield, similarly, we're going to do the same thing. Or at least some, some of the implementations do that. So here's a little state diagram so you can kind of see what's going on here with MLFQ. So every thread is going to start in Q3. When a thread gets selected to run, it will run. If it gets preempted, it's going to go down a level and down a priority. And if from there it gets run and then it gets preempted again, it's going to continue going down until it reaches the bottom. And when you reach the bottom, that just behaves as a round robin queue as normal. We are always, when we are selecting a thread to run, going to choose one from the highest priority queue that has threads. And then when you block and you wake up, you become a high priority thread again. And you can preempt any threads that were running that were of lower priority. Okay. So let's run through an example here. Now we're not going to use a Gantt chart for this because it kind of, I felt like it would make more sense on the state diagram here. So we're going to start with two threads, thread one and thread two, and they're both in the high priority queue, Q3. T1 goes first because T1 was in the front of the line. 
T1 got preempted. So because T1 got preempted, we put it down into Q2. And then on that preemption, you'll notice we did this in a single slide here. We had to choose another thread to run. Well, Q3 still had T2 on it. And since T Q3 is a higher priority, then Q2 T2 is going to run. So thread two is now running. Now when T3 arrives, it is also going to arrive into the highest priority queue, but T2 is still running and it's of equal priority, so there's no reason to preempt it. Now when T2 terminates, we have to choose another thread. We have T1 and T3 in the system, but T3 is in the higher priority queue, so when T2 terminates, we choose T3. And T1 is still waiting down here. So, what happens if T3 blocks? Well, if T3 blocks, then our Q3, you'll see, was empty. And so now we will finally choose T1 to run. If T1 is selected and T1 gets preempted, then it's going to be pushed down into Q1. And then if we have to choose another thread to go, we realize there's nobody in Q3, there's nobody in Q2, so now we can finally choose one from Q1. So we choose T1 again, and when T1 was running, we're going to say that T1 woke T3 up. And the act of waking is actually going to cause um, T1 to get preempted. And then what's going to happen is, so T3, the woken thread, goes into Q3. T1 is going to go back into the queue where that it came from. So now I have to choose, nobody is running, and I've got to choose between T1 and T3. Well, I always choose the higher priority one, so T3 gets selected. And T3 run. Okay? So we're always going to be choosing the highest priority thing to run. Now, there's a problem here. What if we have a whole pile of really interactive threads? Like, let's suppose I'm playing Unreal Tournament. And I'm also let's say ray tracing because it doesn't do a lot of it doesn't yield and it doesn't block <laughs> so let's suppose i'm ray tracing and playing unreal tournament at the same time the ray tracing thread is a long running computational heavy non-yielding non-blocking so what's going to happen is my ray tracer is going to end up sifting down to the lowest priority and unreal tournament is going to stay up in the highest priority thread of queues so when does my ray tracer actually get a chance to run since I'm playing a game at the same time? Well, according to what we've shown you so far, it would never get, and we would actually have a problem of starvation. However, it's very easy to solve. All you need to do to prevent starvation with multi-level feedback queues is periodically take every thread from every queue and put them all back up to the top. So what ends up happening is all the threads start at the top and then they'll sift down depending on how interactive they are. And then periodically we take everybody and we put you all back up. Sift down, back up, sift down, back up. So Solaris, they actually use six levels of this queue, by the way. And their uh, highest priority queue used a 40 millisecond uh, quantum and the lowest priority used a 240 millisecond. And um, then they did the, um, the regrouping they did that every every second. They took every thread and put it back up to the top. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Now this is also the scheduling algorithm, as I said, that's used in Mac OS X. And this is the scheduling algorithm that's used in Windows. Now, I have not used uh, Windows in a long, long time think there's something like 10 levels of priority you can influence that so there's lots of variations on MLFQ that you can do so you can do things like um, you can set a priority for a thread and the idea is if you're setting a priority for the thread you are preventing that thread from falling into lower queues uh, so that's one way you can do it. And if you're sending a wait for a thread in a Unix-based system that uses this, then again, you are preventing the thread from visiting some of those lower pools. So you're increasing the chances that it gets chosen because you're keeping it in the higher priority. So there's lots of variations that you can do for MLFQ. 
All right, but what does our good friend the Linux kernel do? So the Linux kernel, by the way, used to do MLFQ, but they've actually changed this to something else now. And what they do is called the Completely Fair Scheduler, or CFS. Now we're covering this at such a high level that I feel like we almost do it a disservice. There is a paper, you are welcome to read it. My recollection of it, I read it years ago, uh, is that there are red black trees in it, which we no longer talk about in CS240. <laughs> but it's another kind of tree that is um, height log, uh, log n. Uh, anyways, so what we do for the Linux completely for our scheduler is instead of having a different quantum depending on your priority, we're instead going to have every single thread have the exact same scheduling quantum. So no more varying scheduling quantums. It's kind of odd. Uh, instead, in order to ensure that each thread gets its fair share of the CPU according to its priority, we assign a thread a weight. A higher weight means you should get a greater share of the CPU's time than a lower weight thread. And if you're wondering in how do you change the weight or set the weight of a thread or a process, there's actually the lovely command nice. And nice will actually let you alter the weighting to some degree. So the idea then is each time we do a context switch, we want to choose a thread that for this period of time has not yet gotten its fair share. And to compute its share, we have a little bit of math to do. Yay. So what we have, I'm going to switch actually over here to OneNote because I like to write. Let's vary things up. We can almost pretend like we're in a real classroom, you know? Okay, so what we've got is um, we're going to compute. We have two things for each thread. We have what's known as, let's use black here, the actual runtime. which is how long a thread has actually run for. And when we say run for, we mean actually use the CPU. And then we're going to, from the actual runtime, we are going to compute something called the virtual runtime. And in brackets, I'm just going to put VR here. And this is equal to, and we're going to call actual runtime AR out of laziness. So virtual runtime is the actual runtime multiplied by the sum. of all threads weights divided by your weight. So if your actual runtime was five and your weight was let's say 10 and the sum of all weights in the system is 100, then your virtual runtime would be 5 times 100 over 10. So this is going to be 50. So for each thread, we're going to compute this virtual runtime. And then what's going to happen is we are always going to choose the thread with the smallest virtual runtime because the thread with the smallest virtual runtime has not yet had its fair share of the CPU. And the idea behind this virtual runtime is that it's going to advance much more slowly for threads with higher weights than threads with lower weights. And just to give you an example of that, so if we go back over here to OneNote, so this was a thread in black here with a weight of 10. Uh oh, OneNote has crashed again. If I had another thread, and I'll draw it here in red, with the same specs but a lower weight, let's say it had weight 2, then its virtual runtime would be.
250. So of these two threads, we would end up choosing the first thread with the higher weight because its virtual runtime advances more slowly. So you can actually see this. We have an example here. So if we have an example where the total weight of all threads in the system is 50 and the scheduling quantum is 5. So we've got these three threads. Here is their total weight and here is their initial actual runtime. Which thread are we going to choose? And then which thread will we choose after that scheduling quantum expires? So if you go to the next slide, there's actually the answers. So first we compute the virtual runtime for each thread. And yes, this is a typo here. It should just be T. So what we've got here is this uh, thread one with the highest weight has a virtual runtime of 10. Thread two has 12 and a half and thread three has a virtual runtime of 50. So we're going to choose thread one to go first. And so thread run is going to run until its quantum expires, which is five units later, at which point T plus five, we now have thread run has still the weight of 25, but its actual runtime has advanced by five units because it got selected to run. So thread one's new virtual runtime is now 20 units, whereas the threads that were not selected, theirs did not change. So next time we will choose then thread two to go. And because the higher priority threads will always be advancing their actual runtimes, uh, there will come a point where the virtual runtime of a lower priority thread actually is smaller than the higher priority threads. So the low priority threads will get an opportunity to run. So there won't be any starvation. Now this actually brings up some interesting discussion about what do you do when a thread is new? Because when a thread is new, its actual runtime is zero and its virtual runtime will also be zero. So that would, and it would may take a really long time for that brand new thread or a thread that has been blocked for a very long period of time. It may take a really long time for them to have a virtual runtime that is greater than the other threads in the system. And what that would mean is that we may unfairly run new or freshly unblocked threads for a really long period of time, pushing off all of the other threads in the system. So we don't usually set the virtual runtime for a new thread or an unblocked thread to be reality we sometimes select your initial virtual runtime until you actually get a chance to run to be somewhere between the minimum in the system and the maximum in the system. Uh, and that way you are not getting a disproportionate amount of time at the beginning to run, whereas all the other threads uh, may not run for a very long time. So there are ways of dealing with, with issues of unfairness and there's no starvation and this is fairly simple to implement. So this is a pretty neat, pretty neat method here. And if you want to know more, uh, I will try to remember to dig up the paper and post that to Piazza. If I post papers, like I have the Spectre and Meltdown papers posted, um, I don't expect that you're going to read them. I'm not going to ask you questions about that. This is just extra information for those of you who find this topic interesting or easy. It's there for you to read. All right. We have one more thing to talk about because something we haven't discussed is how do you handle multi-core processors? Everything we've assumed so far is a single core CPU. What if I have multiple cores? Well, actually, it's not that bad. There are two main solutions that you could go. First off, you could do a shared ready queue. So one scheduler can, is used for all of the cores. This is called the shared ready pool. Now the advantage of this is that it's pretty easy to implement, but there are a lot of disadvantages to this particular strategy. So here's the problem. If you have a bunch of cores and they all want a new thread because all of them are, let's say two or three of them got, uh, yielded or preempted all at the same time, how many th of those threads that need to be preempted can have access to this shared ready pool at the same time? Well, only one because the shared ready pool is a shared resource. So we're going to have to block some of these cores from having a new thread selected while 
somebody one of the other cores is getting its new thread so essentially what you're getting is contention for a shared resource and you may be like oh it's only four cores it's not a big deal if it has to wait an extra 10 milliseconds to get a new thread okay sure but that's for your apple watch that's for your ti calculator I've got 12 cores here. I don't really want each of my 11 of my 12 cores to each wait. You know, the first core is going to wait 30 milliseconds. The second core gets to wait 60 milliseconds. The third core gets to wait, you know, 180 milliseconds. Each one is waiting more and more and more. And that's just my computer sitting in front of me. What about my research machine with 32 cores? What about Pixar's render farm or what a digital's render farm, which once upon a time was on the top 500 supercomputer list? What about them? The problem with the shared ready queue is while it's very, very easy to implement, the contention for the shared resources really doesn't scale well. So the more cores you have, the more CPUs you have, the more waiting is going to happen and the lower the performance is going to end up being because you're going to spend way too much time waiting to get a new thread and not enough time actually executing a new thread. One of the other problems with the shared ready queue is each and every single time a thread runs, it may run on a different core. And if you remember, we talked about caches in our last episode a little bit in the episode before that. And we said that, you know, for our MMU, we clear the cache, the TLB, every time there's a context switch between processes. And that makes sense because the TLB would be full of entries that only belong to a particular process. But, you know, your CPU has these L1 and L2 caches, and they're not just used for TLB entries, they're used for actually caching data. So here's the thing. If you're a thread and you ran and you put a whole bunch of data in the cache and then we don't clear the cache out in, on context switches, uh, which for, for the non-TLB caches, that's usually the case. And let's say you come back to that same CPU, what are the chances that in between the two times you've ran, you still have some data in that cache? Well, there's actually some pretty good chance of that. And if there is still data there from the last time you ran, then that's going to speed you up because you don't have to grab it from RAM again because it's still in the cache. The problem is with the shared ready queue, since you're not returning probabilistically to the queue or to the core you ran on before, and each core kind of has its own cache, the chances that you have data in the cache are almost zero which means we have a low cache affinity, which means we're going to have to do more memory accesses and possibly even more secondary storage ask access. And that's not good. We don't like that. Okay. So what is our alternative? Well, the alternative is the other diagram that you see here. It is the per core ready queue. So we're going to have a separate ready queue for each and every core. What are the advantages of this? Well, there's no contention for a shared resource because there's no shared resource. Another advantage of this is if you are a member of core zero ready queue, then you are always going to run on core zero. So the chances of having a good cache affinity, pretty good. So is there any downsides to this? Seems like a very obvious answer. Unfortunately, there are downsides to the per core ready queue. The downsides to per core ready queue are the fact that we don't exactly distribute threads to cores very well. If you actually go back into like Windows 2000 and if you look at Windows XP and Windows 7 and you open up the task manager, you'll actually note that like one or two cores get like 100% of the work and the remaining cores get nothing. So we have a problem of load balancing. Like I was actually even looking at, um, so my, my research machine has 32 cores and I was looking at how much work each of the cores were doing. And I think it was like core 15 was almost completely saturated. And yet there were a whole bunch of other cores that were not saturated at all. Now, to be fair, that core is probably running some essential system that, uh, is a single thread and it's always running but what you don't want to see is one you know having thousands of threads running 
and one or two cores getting all of the work and the rest of the cores getting nothing. That you don't want that. We want the, the jobs to be balanced between the cores. Because what you're gonna end up happening when you have a load disbalance is let's say that all of these threads in this example on the slide have equal priority. Well, lucky thread down here at the bottom gets a core all to itself. So for a one hour period of time, this thread here actually got at the bottom, got to execute for the entire hour. Whereas the five threads sharing this core up here, they got less than, they got like 12 or 11 minutes each to run. So how is that fair? So what we have with the per core ready queues is it's not perfect. We have a problem of load balancing. Now, how do we solve the load balancing? Well, one of the things that you can do is when a thread yields or when a thread uh, wakes up or when a thread enters the system, you can put it onto the queue that's shortest to try to balance things out. Um, and that works to a certain level. Another thing that you can do is you can periodically rebalance, so redistribute the threads. Now, the problem of load balancing, though, is that when you are taking a thread from one core and putting it onto another core, you are destroying the cache affinity. So per core ready queue is not going to, it scales better. You're not going to have contention for shared read resources. You get cache affinity, but because you get load balancing and you have to you know, solve the load balancing problem, you still get some cache affinity, but it's not all, the best it could be because as we start moving threads between cores, the affinity is going to go down. Still better than the other one though. All right, so that's actually the end of scheduling. Oh, I know there are two more slides, but I don't like to read slides. I don't like to read them. I like to rant about things instead. So we're not gonna look at the other two slides because I've already ranted about it. So that's the end of the scheduling topic. It's so nice and neat. It fits into one single episode. In our next episode, we are going to start then a new topic still. And the new topic we'll be starting uh, next week is devices and IO, which is a super fun topic for me at least. We are going to learn about how you communicate with devices uh, how you make device drivers, and we're also going to talk about uh, how uh, hard drives and SSDs work. And then the module that we have following devices and I.O. is one on file systems where you will learn how to read and write files and how files are actually stored on the disk. So lots of exciting things still to come. It's like my favorite half of the course, actually. So we will see you next week. I hope you enjoy the uh, warmer weather while it lasts. I thought today was a play day. Where are you, man? I'll, I'll be there in 10 minutes. All right. Great. All right. Look busy. Don't sign anything while I'm gone. Whenever Steve and I can, we slip away from the office and talk about the future of technology. Just getting away from our desk makes us feel like kids again. It's always about you, it's always about you.
It's amazing to think of all the things we'll be able to do with the technological breakthroughs that are just around the corner. Hey, hey Steve. Steve. What are you doing? Thanks for meeting me here. Pleasure, pleasure. We want to go and get a couple things? Yeah, let's around. grab some stuff. Hmm. I'll be ripe on Tuesday. I'm ripe right now. Hey, pal. Check out this New York produce. Yeah, yeah, we'll squeeze this. You know what uh, Tiger Woods and I have in common? <laughs> Not your golf swing, that I guarantee you. Well, check this out. Just Whee! like Tiger. That's not such a big deal. Well, I think you're jealous. I am not. I think you are. I am not. As a matter of fact, just step right back here and take a look at that. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that great? I forgot my wallet again. <laughs> at least fumble around a while longer. That excuse is getting old. All right, I'll get it. I'll get it. See, here I got the smart card. I'm ready to roll, man. And, and I got some coupons. I'm going to save you a lot of money here. A couple right. of those. $1. Mr. Coupon, all right. It's my secretary. Let me zoom out. Oh, Mr. Gates, did you forget the interviews you have all over campus? Well, don't worry. I got it covered. We'll go to plan B. Thanks. I've still got a few errands to do. Uh, just this book. It's it's for a friend. Oh, hello, Mr. Gates. Just be a moment. Here you go. Did you ever uh, find that lost sweater of mine? Uh, no, no, but uh, we're still looking. Well, it really was one of my favorites, so keep looking. Okay. See you next week. We look to the future when innovation will give us the time to do the things we really love.